The Australian bushfires. Some of you uh, think back, wow, yeah, that happened this year. Harry and Meghan, you know, decided to leave the royal family this year. COVID-19, of course, was the big thing that came on the scene and has dominated the news, but there were so many other things too. Kobe Bryant's death, you remember that? The helicopter crash? Then, of course, there was the impeachment of, of Donald Trump and his uh, subsequent acquittal. Stock market crash that happened after that, yes, that happened. Some of us are like, what, really, that happened? Uh, the killing of George Floyd, of course, was a huge thing in the news this year. And um, this didn't make the list here in this article, but of course, Breonna Taylor in March, uh, her death as well. And of course, all of the Black Lives Matter protests that happened after this. Kim Jong-un's death, well, his rumors of death that uh, ever, were kind of swirling around for a while. There was a big Twitter hack that took place uh, this year. Many people have forgotten completely about that. Uh, Ghislaine Maxwell was arrested. That's the cohort of Jeffrey Epstein, the partner in crime. And so good for that. Um, but uh, murder hornets arrive in the United States. This was on the list uh, in this article. Of course, the Beirut explosion, which is a huge, huge thing, which normally would have got so much more coverage, but there were so many other things already taking place in our crazy world. Uh, some of you remember Chadwick Boseman's death. That's the, the Black Panther guy. Um, his death as well was this year. All of the West Coast wildfires. This is one that's really been uh, in the news even with the pandemic. We've still heard about this a fair bit. Uh, this was the year that Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, uh, obviously a very historic political character in the United States. Eddie Van Halen died this year, right? Those of you that were big Eddie Van Halen fans. And of course, the U.S. election, which finally just ended. And on top of all that, we, we knew that Alex Trebek passed away as well. Well, we've started 2021 with the riots in the Capitol building. That's already how we're beginning 2021. And so not a good pattern. But 2020, yeah, the year from hell, that's maybe a, a good title for it. And there were so many other things that could have been mentioned as well. There was like, you know, a, a great big um, volcano in the Philippines that happened. There was, you know, a hurricane down in Louisiana that didn't even get mentioned. There were so many other things that happened in 2020. Now, some of these things are just tragic events. And when they happen, you know, you just kind of hope for a better year the next year. But there's something bigger, I think, beneath all of these events that is more disturbing to me. And I've actually heard the same thing from a lot of people. And that trend is just how divided people are. And, you know, a picture like this that shows kind of this division that we're experiencing in the pandemic is maybe just a metaphor for a lot of the other division that we've been feeling in so many different areas lately. Obviously, politically and ideologically, um, the U.S. election was almost split right down the middle. It's like, how much more divided can we be? And in Canada, we have a, a similar dynamic, not to the same extreme, of course, but racial issues, you know, just when you think maybe there's been some progress, you realize, wow, we have so far to go in all of this. COVID, of course, has been a big thing, not just as a pandemic, but in terms of how it divides people. Even many families are divided about how to follow the guidelines. And, you know, that's created a lot of tension. We're living in this kind of offense culture now as well, where everyone just seems to get angry about everything these days. And of course, social media has been a big part of that. People seem to lose their ability to be kind online. I don't know if you've noticed this, but something weird happens when people are just typing and not seeing each other face to face. And then of course, there's the cancel culture that's become so popular. Individuals, groups, and even the media, everyone just wants to silence people who have a different opinion from them. And it's all just gotten so intense. Guys, I'm, I'm sure the pandemic isn't helping in all of this. You know, all of the extra stress and anxiety that people are feeling. Probably the extra time on social media as well. But that really can't be an acceptable excuse. I have to say the cancel culture thing is particularly disturbing to me. You know, when people disagree but are willing to dialogue and listen and learn well there's hope in that situation but once we start writing people off without even having a conversation guys that's really dangerous how can we start getting along despite our differences guys i think that this is a really important and timely series that we're embarking on today over the next four weeks we're going to be talking about unity and about the fact that we each have a personal responsibility to contribute to it. And so our series is entitled Unity. Unity starts with you. Now, we chose that title 
to highlight the personal responsibility that we all have in the topic of unity. But to be completely factual, I want to clarify that the only reason that we can even pursue unity is because of God. And I actually want to give you a little bit of what I call a theology of unity today. Just understanding, looking in the Bible, what we can learn about unity and where it comes from and how it's developed. First of all, you need to understand that God has always existed as three persons. We talk about the Trinity. Often when we think of God, we think of one person, but there's actually three persons in the Godhead, in the Trinity. And so long before the universe was even created, the three persons of the Trinity actually existed, coexisted in unity. And this is very significant because it highlights the very nature of God. It actually reminds us that unity is divine. It is perfection. It is the ideal that we need to strive for. God created mankind after that in his image, male and female. See, he designed us for unity at every level. He made the family unit, which is again an opportunity for unity. And later on, he formed a nation to be his own people. He gave them his rules to follow so that they could live in unity with God and with one another. And his design was that this nation would actually be a light to the entire world, sort of a beacon of unity that people could look to. Through Isaiah, the prophet, God actually said this. Look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 49. Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Guys, at the height of Israel's unity, King David actually saw it. And it was so impressive to him. He actually sang about it. He wrote a song that begins like this in Psalm 133. It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And so guys, I would describe it this way. Unity is sort of this ah moment. It is so rare, but so refreshing when we experience it. I would say it's kind of like those rare moments over the holidays when everyone is just getting getting along. You know, if you're in the Sawatsky household and you see us playing games and all this kind of stuff, you will see there can be like a lot of tension and we can get pretty intense, but sometimes there's just those little pauses, those moments that are so refreshing when everyone's getting along and it's just sort of like, ah, right? Well, Israel, you know what? They struggled to stay unified, to maintain that feeling. And for most of the Old Testament, it was really a divided kingdom full of infighting, just constant infighting and division. In the New Testament, Jesus' disciples, of course, being Jewish, were still hoping to see Israel be that unified kingdom. And that's what they were really looking forward to. But Jesus taught them about a spiritual kingdom that needed to come first. It was more important. And that the key to unity was all about individuals submitting to one father in heaven, that that's how we become unified together. Now, that's a great concept, but obviously you can imagine it posed a real problem for people, people like us. You see, how could evil sinners like us even enter into the family of a holy God, right? You go back and you look at the Old Testament law and what did the law teach us? It taught us that our sin is an offense to God. It's deserving of death and it actually blocks us from his presence. Well, Jesus shed his blood on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. And his disciples came to understand that. And when we come to Christ in faith, guys, and humbly ask him to apply his sacrifice to our sins, he makes us holy in God's eyes. That's the miracle of being justified. That's the term that we use, justified. It just means being made right with God. Look at what it says in Romans chapter five. Therefore, since we have been justified, this is talking about believers, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And guys, once we come into God's kingdom, his royal family, if you will, we start to live under his good rules and by his good ways and everything changes. And you know what? Here's the biggest thing. We start to experience unity. This is what happens as we all follow God together. We're probably a little naive to think that the world around us today is going to experience more unity. After all, we're driven by so many different ideologies and faiths and agendas and values. Think about it, people all over the world. But in Christ's kingdom, we have the potential for real real unity 
as we all agree to follow Christ together. And guys, when you experience it, you have the same reaction that King David had in the Old Testament when he saw God's people living in unity. It's, ah, it's such a great feeling. Now, speaking of unity, I'm guessing that you're just like me. You know, I have people who, even when they disagree with me, they're just wonderful people. They make me feel so loved and accepted. And even when they're disagreeing with me, there's just that good, peaceful, comfortable feeling. But I also have other people who always seem to leave me with that knot in the pit of my stomach. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so it seems like it's either, ah, or it's, ugh. You know, it's, it's one or the other. These are very primal, <laughs> visceral sort of, you know, reactions that I'm communicating this morning. I've actually re resorted to sounds now, but that's how sort of primal this is. And you may be interested to know that God has always wanted you to feel the, ah, that's what God's always wanted for you. That feeling of unity. Have you ever wondered about what God really wants? Why he made the universe? Why he's, what he's actually wanting in human history? Well, you actually heard it in the scripture reading this morning that Pastor Mitch gave in John chapter 17. And I want you to look here at one of the verses, John 17, verse 11. Jesus said, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name that you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. So guys, God's plan very clearly has always been about unity. Now, I'm giving you this theology of unity this, this morning because I really want you to see a few things very clearly. Here's the first one. The first one is that unity has always been God's desire. I hope you've seen that already. This is what God has wanted. That's how he designed things. It's part of his character. He's built it into the world. That's why he gave us the law. That's why Christ came and died on the cross. And that brings us to the second point. Christ is the one who has made po unity possible for us. We can actually experience unity because Christ has paved the way back to God. He has taken care of the sin that blocked our path from God, that shut us off from God. And so that brings us to point C. Since Christ left, it is now up to God's children to demonstrate unity. And these are all very important aspects of this theology of unity. It's in this sense that we are saying unity starts with you because Christ has left now and has left us with the responsibility of being this beacon of light for people and showing God's unity. Guys, every one of us who calls ourselves a child of God, you know what? We have a responsibility. We've been called to be beacons of unity for the people around us. And Jesus prayed in John 17 for our protection. Did you notice that in verse 11? He prayed for our protection. He prayed that because if Satan can divide the children of God, guess what? There is no beacon left for people to see what God is like and the unity that he brings. We're not talking this morning, guys, about something that is trivial in this series. In fact, this theme of unity gets very little attention when in fact, it is a major theme of the writings of the New Testament. It is everywhere. I'm going to read some verses for you this morning, just so that you can see how prevalent it is. And I'll put the references here. I hope this week that you'll take the time to actually look these verses up. But I want you to just hear quickly how much the New Testament talks about unity. 1 Corinthians 1, it says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. In 1 Peter 3, 8, it says, finally, all of you be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Philippians 2, 2, make my joy complete, being like-minded, Paul says, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Colossians 3, again, Paul says, and over all these virtues he was talking about, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11 says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice, strive for full restoration, encourage one another, be of one mind, live in peace. Ephesians chapter 4, it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. 
I love this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And then Romans chapter 15, verse six says, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See that with one mind and one voice. Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another. Pretty basic, live in harmony with one another. Philippians 1, 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. You hear that? As one. Romans 14, verse 19, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Guys, sometimes when you do a search on a theme like this in the Bible, you find a bunch of what I call near misses. But I have to tell you, these verses are all direct hits. They're all nailing this topic of unity right in the heart. It's all about unity. In fact, I did a quick search that actually brought up a hundred different verses on the theme of unity. A hundred different verses. Words like same mind, you know, harmony, peace, one spirit, unity, all of these terms being used over and over again, particularly in the New Testament. Guys, you see, Jesus' disciples knew what Jesus was all about. They had spent a lot of time with him. They knew his heart. And they knew what Jesus prayed about, what he longed to see happen after he left this earth and put, you know, responsibility in our hands. And I want you to see, again, some verses in John 17. Jesus prayed, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Let's keep going. It says, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And so you see here, guys, it's really all about unity. All of us together in Christ and in God. And did you catch that last verse? If you look at that last verse, you know, ask the question, how is the world going to know that God loves them? Do you see what it's saying there? It's saying when they see us, God's children living in unity. And so note this, guys, the world will know God loves them when they see his children living in unity. Guys, I can't help but think that the world is in real need of some unity right now. People are dying for that ah, feeling. And it's up to us to show them how God's family lives. You know, when they see true unity, you know what actually happens? It shocks them so badly that they actually wake up to the fact that there is a God and a God who loves them. They actually see it through us. And so guys, I want to get really real with you here for a second this morning. Here's what I'm really saying today and that God's word is telling us. It really matters how we treat one another. It really matters how we speak to one another. It really matters that we all be learning the values of Jesus together. So we're following him together. It really matters how we handle our differences of opinion. It really matters, guys, listen, how we engage each other on Facebook. It really matters about how we speak about one another. And it really matters that we grow in our ability to discuss our differences. It really matters that we learn how to listen to other people. Guys, these things matter deeply to God. In a world where people are constantly being offended and up in arms, guys, here's the deal. God's children, we need to be different People are exhausted with all of the bickering and the polarization and the anger. We have the chance to be, ah, to people. Guys, how good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And we're going to drive this point home over the next few weeks. One last point for today before we wrap it up. And that is, I want you to be clear that we're talking here about unity, not uniformity. These are not the same thing. We don't all have to think the exact same way in order to have unity. Now, as God's children, we will certainly have a measure of uniformity when it comes to our beliefs. After all, we do follow the same Bible and many truths are black and white. 
right? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Jesus is God, right? Salvation is by faith. But there are going to be many places where even with our most sincere study, we're just going to disagree on some things. And these are the times that will really test our ability to remain united with each other. I'm talking about differences on lesser doctrinal issues, different convictions on things in the gray areas, differences of opinion on ideology and even politics, different ideas on parenting practices. That's a touchy one, right? Different perspectives on a whole variety of different things. But guys, being united despite these differences, although it seems like a huge challenge, it's actually even a better opportunity to show the world that we are like our Father. Guys, if you look around the world, this creation that God has made, you will see very quickly that God likes diversity. He likes variety. Now, I'm not talking about diversity for diversity's sake, where everything goes. That's kind of the way the world treats diversity today. If it's different, it has to be good. No, not necessarily. But we are talking about nuance in our perspectives. And I think God appreciates that nuance. Our differences actually allow us to work together as one greater unit. You know, the New Testament teaches that we are one body. It's a great metaphor that is used throughout the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look at what it says. It says, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And, you know, Paul talks about how the different parts of the body are dependent one upon the other. And in this body, we all follow Christ. Christ is the head that we all follow. He gives us our direction. He, de- he determines what's true. But we all have our unique roles to play, and we all see things from our own perspective. I, let me just kind of wrap it up today with a silly sort of illustration. You know, to your eyes, your nose kind of looks like a ski slope, right? You look down, for some, the slope is <laughs> more steep than for others, but, you know, that's kind of how it looks to your eyes. But if your belly button was looking up at your nose, you know what it would see? It would see sort of a double drainage spout, right? It's a different perspective. Your toes look up and they say, man, I would just really love to see the nose again. I haven't seen them in years, right? Unity is not the same as uniformity. And we're going to pick this up again next Sunday. We're going to continue on by talking about the character traits that unity actually requires. And so we'll see you then. 